Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So it's my pleasure to have uh, Joe Labiola here from Brown. Uh, Joe was here to interview the topic group uh, yesterday, and he's uh, kindly offered to come and demo. Thank you. So uh, as Ken said, my name is Joseph Laviola, and I'm a PhD candidate at Brown University, and I study under the direction of Andy Van Dam. And I'd like to talk to you today about my PhD work, which is something entitled Mathematical Sketching, and it's a new approach for creating and exploring dynamic illustrations. So first what I'll do is we'll give you a little bit of an outline. I'll, I'll talk about some of the motivations behind the work. Uh, we'll, we'll look at mathematical sketching, sort of define what it is. Uh, I'll look at some of the related work that's been done in the area. Then I'll go right to a demonstration of, of uh, mathematical sketching, which has uh, been developed in the context of the MathPad squared prototype application. Then we'll go underneath the hood a little bit and look at some of the details uh, underneath uh, the, what mathematical sketching is. Uh, talk about a little, little bit about the early feedback we've received, and then I'll give some conclusions and some future work. So diagrams and illustrations uh, are very useful for explaining variety, a variety of concepts, mathematical concepts, physics concepts. And you see them in a variety of locations. You see them in, in various textbooks. You see them in, in notebooks. Students use them uh, uh, as an aid to help them solve problems. And it, what you see here are just a couple of examples which I, I took from uh, a, 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 a physics textbook. The first one here is just uh, sort of an illustration to sort of, get the, uh, sort of give you the idea of a, a starting point of a, a constant velocity versus a constant acceleration problem. And the bottom one here is, is just looking at uh, really uh, just uh, projectile motion starting off the tabletop and just sort of seeing the angle that, it, that it, uh, it makes as it hits the ground. Now the problem with these is that they're, they're static in nature. You write them down and they only give you the initial formulation of the problem. You can't really see what happens afterwards. And that's sort of the main motivation behind mathematical sketching. So what is mathematical sketching? Mathematical sketching is the ability to create dynamic illustrations from handwritten mathematics and drawings. So the idea is that you can write down mathematics, you can make a drawing, and you can combine them together via some association mechanism to make these really personalized visualizations, to make these visualizations come alive. And when I say handwritten mathematics, um, I'm really sort of talking about a more broader definition. And I'll show you some examples in a little bit of what that is. But we're also, we also do things such as programming constructs and some flow of control constructs to be able to do some more interesting sketches. Now, a math sketch is typically a relatively small scale disposable type of activity, uh, something you can do in, in five minutes uh, to illustrate a concept. We want to uh, take advantage of mathematical notation because it's something that people have been using, or at least they're, they're taught to use very early on in their education. But also interested in sort of uh, making sure that when the users create their, their drawings, that they're free form in nature. We don't have any set primitives. And the reason for this is we, kind of try to, we really want to try to keep it in this sort of notebook, pencil, and paper style. And as a result of that, we has, I've had some design principles as I've done the work. And one of the, the, the most important is to sort of keep this pencil and paper style. I want to be able to almost to be as if you're writing on a, on a pencil, on a, on a on a piece of paper with a pencil, and the only difference is that you've got this incredibly powerful computer underneath it to be able to do things. I'm very interested in the gestural user interface uh, sort of that sort of goes along with that, and what I'm focusing on is trying to minimize the gesture set. So just minimize the amount of gestures that, that the user has to remember, but at the same time use various uh, principles such as context and location in order to maximize the number of tasks that can be done. And as I said before, we, what we want to have is the mathematics to drive the element behavior. And what that means is we want to try to infer as much as we can from the mathematics in order to figure out what we're going to be doing with the drawings. 
And of course, I needed one. I wanted to be able to keep generality. Uh, there are a number of systems out there that sort of are domain specific, and I'm very interested in sort of using the mathematics as my my, my sort of general notation, which 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 can then be used to animate. So what what makes these mat what makes mathematical sketching unique? Well, if you look at the related work, what you see is that there are a number of systems out there that do dynamic illustrations or have various components of mathematical sketching, but none of them have all of these sort of components combined. So there, there's been work you know, early on, such as uh, Thing Lab or uh, some commercial products such as the Geometry Sketch Pattern Interactive Physics, which allow you to create dynamic illustration. However, they are mostly WIMP-based interfaces, and they also um, don't really expose the mathematics to the user. Now, there are pen-based systems out there. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with MIT's Assist project. Uh, which is now a power toy for, in the tablet, for tablet PC. Uh, and that allows you to create dynamic illustrations by sketching out primitives. Once again, with this, with this type of system, it's domain specific. It gets sent directly to a mechanical engineering package. Uh, primitives are their smart primitives. And it doesn't expose the mathematics to the user, which is something that, that we really wanted to focus on. Now, there are a number of gestural systems out there as well. But the difference between our system and, and some of these other gestural systems, such as uh, the Sketch system or, or Teddy, uh, is that these are often moded. So you have to press a button in order to activate a different mode, whether it be a keyboard shortcut or the button on the pen. Uh, one of our goals, one of my goals, was that we wanted to have it modeless. So you, it, you know, you don't, there aren't really modes when, you, when you're writing with pencil and paper. We want to sort of to translate that into the application. Now, there are, of course, computational systems, MATLAB, Mathematica, that can allow you to do these types of dynamic illustrations. But those require really a programming language and, and a one-dimensional programming language instead of a natural two-dimensional notation that mathematics provides. Now, mathematical recognition and parsing is obviously a key component in mathematical sketching. And there's been a lot of work done in it. It's been going on since the mid-60s, prior to the first work done by Anderson in 68. But most of this work has been done simply to try to come up with the technologies to actually be able to do recognition and parsing. And it's still an open problem, but we're just now starting to be able to see where the, the technology is advanced enough so that you can do something with it. And there are a couple of examples of, uh, of applications that allow you to do things. For example, the pen calc system, which is really just a very simple math calculator. Uh, and then there's the math journal, which is probably closest in spirit in, uh, to my work. It allows you to do things like uh, solve mathematical problems. And actually, just very recently, they came out with a animation engine that's actually pretty similar to mine. Uh, but one of the things they don't do is they don't have these flow of control constructs that I, that I provide. So mathematical sketching has been implemented in the context of the MathPad squared application. And this is a picture of it. And what I'd like to do now is run through some mathematical sketches so that you can get a better sense of what, it, of what they do. So let's go ahead and do that. So let's say, for example, that you are a teacher in an introductory high school physics class. And you're interested in conveying the notion of what constant velocity and constant acceleration is. So what the teacher could do is make a very simple sketch here and show it to uh, his or her class the next day. So let's go ahead and do that. So the first thing I'll do is I'll draw a road, like so. And I'll draw two cars. So we'll put one car here. And you'll notice as I draw this car, I've drawn it with three distinct ink elements. And I can composite those by simply making a lasso, actually making a lasso and a tap. And then I'll make another car here. So now I'll write some mathematics, which will specify the behavior of these drawing elements. So the first one we'll call this guy here m. We're going to give him a constant velocity. So we'll say m sub x t equals 15t. And we recognize that by circling and tapping. Now what you notice here is 
I, I use a trained recognition engine, so users have to write symbols a certain amount of times. We'll talk about that in a bit. Well, what, what we've experimented with is representing the results of the recognizer in the user's own handwriting. So the, the, with the goal being that if you, make a, if you recognize some math, it shouldn't look any different if it's correct. And that's so that I, I, as you sort of see me write these math, you, you'll, you'll, you'll sort of see them start to change a little bit, but we're trying to sort of keep them as if, as if you wrote them. Now, we have a, a little combo box, a little box here that shows you the parse of the expression. Currently, we're, I'm still working on representing the, 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 uh, the parsing structure in the user's own handwriting, which is a little bit more difficult to do, and I'll talk about that in a bit. So let me go ahead and write, uh, write the equations for this car over here. We'll call, let's say this guy's a police car. So I'll write P sub x of t equals... 3 over 2 t squared. And just take a look at the parse there. Now what I'll do is I'll give my animation some time. I want it to run for some amount of time. So I'll just say let's let t go from 0 to 12. So I've written this down, and now what I, like, what I need to be able to do is I need to label my drawing. And I can do that very easily by just writing the letters down that correspond to the math. So we'll call this M. We'll call this P. And what the system does internally is it actually finds the mathematics it needs to animate a particular drawing, and I'll talk about how we do that later. The last thing I'll do is I'll give my drawing some scale. So let's say the length of this road is 200 units long. And once that's done, I can run my sketch. And we can see that, indeed, the police car catches up and actually drives right past the, the speeding car. Or the, but we want them to catch up. We want them to sort of stop there. So one of the other features you can, you can do, yes, question. Um, the mathematics sort of, is, we, we have some, some rules internally. So you see how this is m of x of t, and this is p of x of t? The x represents the, the, uh, the coordinate axis that we're dealing with. So if I were to go horizontally, it would be m y of t. Okay? So sort of a convention we have, in, in the, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. So let me go ahead and graph these two. using a simple graph gesture. And if I want to change the domain of, of the graph, I can just write in the values. So we can see at 10 time units is when they actually intersect. So what I'll just do is I'll come over here, erase the 2, write a 10, and rerun. And you'll see that in this case, the police car catches up to the speeding car and gives him a ticket, and he's very upset about it. So what we actually have here is an interactive notebook, which you can change different parameters and you can observe the effects. So let's go to another example. Yes, go ahead. Um, okay. Um, what you we'll, we'll sort of get to this when we get under the hood of, of the of how, how it works. But what you have, what you you don't necessarily have to provide it, but you can provide a way to dimension the drawing so that there's a way to map between simulation and animation space. And what the system looks is for the idea are non-animatable objects, or animatable objects are functions of t in this particular case. So it would look for that, find it, figure out how long it was, and then use that to, to build the mapping so that you could actually um, do the... Um, you can't. You could do that, but then, then there are other issues as well, especially when you get into other types of sketches. So let me do. This is one of the more famous sketches that all the powers that be have seen. This is an example of a, a 2D projectile motion. Uh, so these are the mathematics for that. And what I'll do here is, I will just draw a little playing field. Let's say we're going to see if a ball can go over a fence. If somebody has enough power to hit a home run. 
So I'll put a ball here. And I'll write, let's say we'll give it 125 units. This is actually meters. And we have a little guy here with a bat in his hand. Now another way we can associate mathematics to drawing is explicitly by just grabbing the math and tapping on the individual drawing element. And when I do that, we'll see. Yes, indeed, just gets over the fence. So he hits a home run. Everybody's happy. So let's, let, let's, let's, let's reduce the number of, uh, let's the, reduce the speed. So instead of h equals 38, do h equals 31. Oops. When I rerun that, you'll see in his case, it doesn't have enough power in the ball. It actually goes right through the playing field, which probably isn't a good thing. But that's okay, because we didn't specify that it wasn't supposed to do that. So if you look at the math here, this particular equation here is going to tell us when this quantity is equal to zero, at what level it's, it's, it's going to be zero. So I can solve this equation very easily by using a very simple solve, uh, solve equation gesture. It's just a little squiggly tail. And once that's done, I can see, well, t equals zero and five is when the ball is at ground level. So I'll just come over here, erase that, write five. Oops. Let me run. And we'll see in this case that the ball lands right on the ground. So let's go to a little more complicated example. It has a little more interesting uh, notions about it. And this example represents damped harmonic oscillation. One of the things we wanted to be able to do was provide a way to stretch objects. And in this case, what we have is a nailing facility to do that. So what I'll do is I will create a little ceiling here. And I'll draw something that looks like a spring, a little block in it. Now, I can nail individual ink objects together by using a nail gesture. And that is just a little lasso and tap. And you notice I keep mentioning lasso and tap, lasso and tap over and over again. And that's, that's what I was talking about, minimizing the gesture set, but in doing so, trying to maximize the functionality you get. So let's just go ahead and associate this math to this block and run sketch. And you'll see that because I nailed the two objects together, internally the system knows uh, that it has to stretch that particular object. I'll just run it one more time. Now, it does not know that this is a spring. This, is, this could be anything. Okay, but the idea is that you, you know, you're stretching it based on these nails. Um, the block isn't stretching because the way the algorithm works is it says, okay, if I nail to something, all right, let me look and see if there's any other nails associated with that particular drawing element. And if there is, then I know that I, I have something that can stretch. So let's, let's figure out what drawing element is moving. Right? In that case, the block is moving, so the block doesn't need to stretch. So if you draw them backwards, the block would be stretching. Yeah, that's right. Very good question. Um, mm -hmm. Let me just say that what you end up getting with these nailing, with, with this, this nail, uh, you start getting into a lot of complexities when you start nailing multiple objects together. Um, what, it, what it becomes eventually is you end up needing some type of constraint satisfaction you know, algorithm in there. And, you know, I decided, at least, or at least my, my committee decided that we didn't want to go there at this point. Maybe something to do in the future. Yeah. <laughs> but, but what you, one of the things that I did want to be able to do is all the sketches that I've shown you are all closed form. So I know every, every, fun, every value at, for, for, for these functions, I know, the, I, I know what the answer is. Let's see what we can do when you, when you don't know that information. So. Let me show you another example, and this is another projectile motion. But what it is, is we're incorporating a drag coefficient. And when you do that, the closed form solutions are a lot more difficult to deal with. So what I, what I ended up doing was allowing the, the, allowing the user to be able to create open form solutions. And what you see here is really 
This is just a simple Euler integration. So we have k, which is our drag coefficient. We have some constants here that we need, initial conditions. h represents you know, how, how far we're moving in at each time step. And this main loop here computes acceleration, position, and velocity through time. So I can just come over here and do something very similar. And I'll draw a ball here. And I'll label it with a P. And you'll notice when I run it, you'll see that you can see the drag coefficient really working on the ball. So it's no longer just you know, a standard parabola that you would get from 2D projectile motion. The other thing you should notice is that when I drew it, um, it didn't exactly correspond to what my initial conditions were. So it actually snaps appropriately. And I'll, it doesn't, if you don't understand that, I'll, I'll explain that in, in some detail later on. So the last sketch I want to show you sort of stemmed from the idea that I had these open form solutions. But what I wanted to be able to do was condition my, my animatable drawing elements to, to move in different directions. Uh, and it turns out that um, what you get is a discontinuous function representation is a wonderful way to specify a very simple if-then-else construct. So what I, I added to was the ability to do that in the context of my open form solution solver. So what this is going to do is this is just going to we have a loop here that changes, changes the velocity uh, of, of an object um, if it hits a wall. Okay? And then, this is, and then the, the function xt plus h is the, is, the, is the actual driving force. So let me go ahead and draw a line. We'll put two walls here. And we'll say this is L. It's 12. In this case, the reason I'm writing L equals 12 instead of just 12 is because the, the, the sketch needs to know what L is in order for it to work. And the last thing I'll do is I'll make the ball. And label it. Oops. It's not the right label. And pay attention to the ball. It's probably going to change its shape. All right, and there's a reason for that. One of the reasons for that is when you're doing collision detection, size is important. Okay? I could draw the ball, and if it's not mapped appropriately to the, uh, to the simulation space, it's not going to collide appropriately. So you have to do something we call rectification, and I'll talk about that in a second. So this just gives you a flavor of what mathematical sketching is and what it does. So now what I'd like to do is... Well, actually, one thing I'd like to say is that this is not all that it can do. We can do other things. We can do things like derivatives, integrals, sim solve simultaneous equations, solve simple ordinary differential equations, do summations and, and simplifications as well. So it, it has a lot of tools built into it that can help you with your math, with your math, creating your math sketches. So if you look at this system architecture, what we really have is a bunch of different modules. We have a user interface component, which sort of connects to a mathematical recognition and parsing system. Uh, the, the system also connects to what I call a, a sketch preparation module, which does a number of different things. It does association inferencing, dimension analysis, and rectification of drawings. And we'll talk about all those. Uh, the system then takes all that information and really you can sort of consider it as, in effect, a small programming language because it translates all, the co all that information into MATLAB code. I use MATLAB as my computational back end. Translates that, does the computations to get data that we need to send to the animation subsystem, which then animates the, the sketch accordingly. So I'll first talk a little bit about the user, the, some of the important user interface issues that, that came into play with math sketching and MathPad squared. And that is with the idea of gestures. And as I mentioned before, um, we want to try to minimize the gesture set, maximize functionality. And the key issue is to be able to support operations fluidly. So what you have to be able to do in this type of application is you have to be able to write, uh, write mathematics. You have to be able to make drawings 
and invoke commands, and you have to do it without any conflicts. And, uh, and of course, on top of that, we wanted to avoid modes. So it sounds you know, like a pretty daunting task to do. But if you make use of two key concepts, you can do it, to, at least to a, a, a very good, um, I guess, a, a very good approximation. You can't do everything, but you can do a lot of things. And that is, one is to use compound gestures, and the other one is to use context sensitivity. Compound gestures are just, instead of having more complicated gestures, you, you sort of scale them back, and you have very simple gestures, very simple primitives that you can combine together. In this particular case uh, that I have on the screen here, what we have is just, uh, this is an erase gesture, which is an erase and tap. So if I was, to, for example, to draw a smiley face and I wanted to draw hair on top of the, uh, on top of the head, um, I could do that without having to worry about accidentally erasing uh, the, the head. The other key component is this notion of context sensitivity, and that is the reuse reusability of gestures by looking at their context and also looking at their location. And this is just an example. As I mentioned before, the lasso and tap. With lasso and tap, I can recognize mathematical expressions and parse them. I can create composite uh, drawing elements. I can do associations from math to drawing. And I can even do uh, the, the nail operation with, 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 with just two basic primitives. And as you can sort of see, there, there's kind of a natural mapping between um, their lo you know, the, the tap location or the size of of the lasso and what you're supposed to do. So that's sort of a key, a key area that I'm continuing to explore. Question? Mm -hmm. uh, you can label it any time you want to. Question? Very good. Yeah, that's right. Um, I don't. I don't have anything built in right now. But one of the things that I've been thinking about is coming up with sort of a online type of real-time help system that will detect these gestures and then tell you what can happen, you know, in the next, you know, with the next gesture you have, and then that would sort of go along, and then eventually you would learn it and it would, you know, go away. Uh, gr group, the, uh, I mean, I don't have anything, you know, within the context of the application that, that can change it. But I mean, there's something that certainly could be done. You had a question? Very, yes. Um, <laughs> currently, I don't have an undo, which is something that's obviously extremely important. Uh, it's just it wasn't really on my critical path. But, it, you know, it's something that definitely needs to be there. Um, well, when when you right, well, la lassos only um, when when you lasso something, okay, and if that tap is is anything but not on the lasso line, it it's it's going to think it's 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 mathematics. If you tap on that on the lasso line, it's think, it thinks it's a drawing. That's the way to distinguish it. Uh, I've also explored issues ways of trying to do that automatically. Like the Tablet PC SDK has an ink divider, which at least the, the theory is that you can distinguish between all different types of different drawings. And I experimented with that, and it didn't work so well. But um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, right. Yeah, th there's, as I, I, you I sort of go through this, what you, what you find is that it's always going to be one or two cases where it might break. But I believe that I've been able to get the majority of the cases you know, in, incorporated into it. Uh, not at the moment. <laughs> but that's certainly something that, you know, like I said, all, all of these issues you sort of have to think about when, you, when you're doing it. I mean, you're not going to be able to get everything. <laughs> Question? <laughs> yes. and. That um, originally I, I I did do that I I had a little status bar underneath, um, and it, it displayed the parse in, in a one-dimensional representation, uh, and I took that out 
because I wanted more screen real estate to be able to do. And the idea always was that I would, I would present the parsing information to the user without having to do that button. It's just something that I haven't done yet. It's part of the plan. Sure, there's a number of different ways you could do it. So one of the key components, of course, is the math recognition and parsing system. And uh, I've gone through a number of iterations uh, in, in, in building this, uh, the, 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 the RICO system. Uh, my first approach was simply just to use the Microsoft handwriting recognition engine uh, and then do some, uh, some hard coding with, with some, of the, some of the other symbols. And that got me a little bit, got me some, I got me, it got, got me started really. But it became clear that what I needed was something a little more sophisticated and a little more, um, uh, something that would give me a more s sort of stronger set of, of, uh, of symbols to use. So I sort of built my own recognition engine. And uh, the key with this though is that it's writer dependent. So you, we have a training application, you write each symbol 10 to 20 times. Uh, which isn't too bad. It takes about 45 minutes to do it for maybe 50 symbols. I know if a independent math recognition engine comes along, I'll be happy to put it in there. Um, but we, what we get is that you know a, a much larger lexicon. I can do Greek letters and I can do you know integrals and various other symbols. So the first approach that I took was to use a system developed by Lee in '97 based on dominant points in conjunction with. Uh, using a basic feature classifier. Now, dominant points are really just important points within the stroke. They may be uh, cusp points, points of self-intersection, uh, uh, start and end points, and maybe some points in between those points. And what you would then do is, is take directions right, using those points. So you get a series of, of, of directional information. And then taking that, what it would do is it would take them and send them into a dynamic programming algorithm, do a string matching algorithm to, to detect optimal degree of, of, of similarity. And then we would merge that with the results of, of our traditional feature recognition engine using a weighted average based on training data. Uh, and that worked fairly well. I, I can't give you exact accuracy numbers, but I would say it was, uh, it was in the high 80s. But it became clear that, you know, I mean, for me it was very good, but for example, my advisor, uh, it didn't work so well for him. So I, I realized that, you know, as invariably what happens is, you know, these, these things work great for you, and then when you go out into the field and have them uh, tested, they don't work so well. So I came up with another approach. And this approach combines uh, the Microsoft Handwriting Recognition Engine and uh, a pairwise Adaboost classifier. And the reason, one of the reasons why I chose Adaboost is because it's relatively easy to implement and it also had a number of qualities that I needed uh, to be able to use the, the, um, the features that, that, that I came up with. So this is my only one math slide. I don't know if, if, if you guys are familiar with Adaboost, I won't go into it. No? OK, let me just go into it really, really quickly. This is developed by, uh, by Shapira in 97. And the basic idea is if you're given a training set where you have some data and you know what the answer is. Uh, in this case, it's a pairwise approach, so you're always saying it's negative one or positive one. What you want to be able to do is you have a bunch of weak learning algorithms. Right? May, it, the, the, the condition is that they do fi at least 50%. There's, okay? And what the system does is, is it tries to, it combines them um, looking at the training data and looking at a distribution over the, over, over the training samples. So it initializes a, a distribution. So initially, it's, it's equal across all training samples. And you go through a series of rounds. And with each round, you train your weak learner using this distribution. And you get a weak hypothesis for each one of these, of these weak learners. Uh, and that hypothesis gives you, you know, whether it's negative 1 or 1 in this case. And what it does is then, is then, then computes an error, which is really just the, the sum of these distributions of the training samples that you got wrong. Using that information, it computes a weight, right, which is alpha t. And using that weight, uh, you have to, of course, you store that for each one of your weak learners. And you use that weight to redefine your distribution. Okay? So what it actually does is it puts more weight on training examples that you got wrong. So that as you move through each iteration, it sort of, sort of uses that information to help learn about more difficult training examples. So what you end up getting then is a final hypothesis after you've, you've run the algorithm 
uh, where you sort of sum up all of your weak learners given their weights and, and take, uh, take the sign of, of that value to give you uh, what, what symbol you're looking at. And of course, there's multi-class uh, methods for doing this, but I chose to use a pairwise approach because I, was, I felt that it, it would be easy, or at least you should be able to really distinguish between two symbols. You have one symbol here, one symbol here. You should really be able to, at least with decent accuracy, be able to distinguish between the two. So what happens is then I have a bunch of pairs, right? And uh, just a little bit about, about how I adapted it. Um, the weak learners I use are very, very simple. It's just compute the average, and you're doing a distance to average, you know, which everyone has a, slow, a smaller distance wins. And I spend a lot of time looking at features and coming up with features, and I have over 80 of them uh, that I use. So I actually have 80 weak learners that I'm using in the algorithm. And these, these are you know, some traditional features, um, arc length, uh, number of cusps, number of self-intersections, point histograms, angle histograms, um, to various other features, uh, looking at uh, inflection points of the strokes, things like that. In addition, I also use actually the Microsoft Recognition Engine as, as part of my features, which is kind of interesting. So you, know, you, you give it a symbol, and it says, you know, if this is an A, then it's a 1. And if it's not an A, it's a negative 1. Right? So the basic algorithm is, is for each unique symbol pair, uh, I perform the classification, and I store the results, and the majority wins. Now, the problem with this approach is that if you have n symbols, you have basically n squared minus n over 2 pairs. So, I mean, I have, uh, the, the, the system right now has about 50 symbols. So you're looking at a, quite a number of comparisons. So it was relatively slow. It was, it was more accurate than my previous recognizer, but it was still slow. So I came up with the observation that the Microsoft Recognition Engine is very good at getting at least the symbol correct in its alternate list. Right? I mean, it's very good. I mean, it, it, it gets it you know, right most of the time, but it's almost always in the alternate list. So what I did was I took the recognition engine and I said, okay, well, let's go ahead and, um, and run it on, uh, on one of my symbols and get all of the alternates and take all the alternates that, that, are, that, that I'm interested in and throw away all the, all the junk. Right? So if, if it's in my training set, then I'm going I'm to use it. And then what I also have to do is then say, okay, well, you know, there are some symbols which Microsoft recognizes just doesn't handle. It doesn't deal with square roots and integrals and summation signs. So any of those, let me add that into my list and then send it to the pairwise added boost classifier. And what this ends up doing is it reducing the number of pairs I have to look pretty significantly, so it's much faster, <coughs> but still makes use of the, of, of the sort of the, the writer dependence, which in some sense is a, very, is a good thing. Um, and, but it, and in addition, it makes use of the Microsoft Recognition Engine, which has thousands upon thousands of training examples. So we're trying to sort of get a hybrid approach to get the, uh, the best of both worlds. And I haven't done any formal evaluation on it yet. That will actually start next week when I'll be able to get some, uh, some true accuracy numbers on it. But I'm, I'm confident that it will be in the, you know, in the high 90s. So one of the other, other issues that you have to have with, with a system like this is you've, you've got these symbols recognized. You have to figure out what they mean in the context of a mathematical expression. And that's where parsing comes in. Now, mathematical parsing now, parsing math symbols is much more complicated than, than doing a traditional parse because you have this two-dimensional structure that you have to deal with. And um, you know, I, I I use a very traditional parsing system. Uh, what it is is, is it's you know you, we use a context-free grammar to, and then in addition with that there are rules, geometric rules about relationships between symbols. Whether there's rules for subscripts and rules for superscripts, rules for square roots and integrals. Uh, fractions, so that when the algorithm runs, it sort of does all these conditional tests to see if a given symbol is, you know, a little bit higher, a little bit lower than the previous symbol, and it, it sort of runs through all the symbols and then comes up with um, with the correct parse. One of the things I do make use of uh, is ascenders and descenders. So in the training phase, you actually write the symbols down. Like, if, I don't know if you remember way back when. In, in grade school, when you were practicing your handwriting, you had those nice little lines, right? You know, and if you wrote the P, the P would be down below the line, and the B would be above the line. We use that information 
uh, to help us with, 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 with some of the parsing, especially with subscripts and superscripts. You would be surprised how difficult it can be to get subscripts and superscripts right, given the variety of different ways of writing them. So the results of this are all stored in a parse tree, which we can then use for further processing. And the key issue I want you to realize here is that we have to adapt, or the user has to adapt to the parsing rules that we specify. And we tried to make them as general as possible, but you know, it doesn't work for everyone. So people you know, have to do this, this adaptation. And what we really love is to be able to have the user somehow specify how they write these relationships so they can be more fine-tuned to them. And that's another area of, of future work. That's PhD number two, I guess. So we've looked at the user interface, and we've looked at sort of the math reco and parsing. Another important component is the sketch preparation part. So let's go through some of those, those issues. Now, when I do implicit associations, right, when, I, when I, I label a given drawing, uh, we need to associate all the mathematics which is sort of associated, or w which needs to be associated to that drawing. So if you look at this particular example, what we use is something called label families. So what I do in this particular case is I label this drawing A sub 0. And when I do that, it extracts the core label. Right? And the core label, in this case, is just A. So it's sort of like the base label, not a subscript or superscript or anything. And then what it does do is it goes through the math, and it finds all of the equations that are associated with that core label. From there, it then looks at, at the right-hand side of those equations and finds all the symbols there. And then, and then it, it looks for, for, others, for other symbols on, on the left-hand side. So it keeps doing this recursively until it finds all of the symbols that it needs that sort of, sort of fill up um, the necessary mathematics that it needs. After it does that, then it finds the expressions and, uh, and then sorts them appropriately. So first, it, you, know, it, you put them into a list where first you have the constants, and then you have other constants that depend on those previous constants, and then and then sort of uh, functions, or functions of time. Now, I know someone might be thinking, well, what happens if I have two functions of time that are dependent on each other, okay, which is certainly a possibility. Uh, the system doesn't do it right now, but what it would do would actually look for cycles, okay? And then finding those cycles, it can then uh, send that, uh, it would detect that so that when it sends it to MATLAB, it, it can do an equation, a simultaneous equation solve to come up with the right solution. So that's association question. Ah, um, you can if you were to write zero in another way, like perhaps a zero with a slash through it. Yeah, I mean that, that's one of the nice things about, about doing writer dependence is that you can write them just about how you want. There are some cases where it makes sense, you know, t's and pluses are very difficult to distinguish. So I always say, to, I tell people when they train, write your t with a hook. And that's a good way to distinguish it. Now, I mentioned previously that one of the interesting things you have to have is a correspondence or a mapping between simulation space and, your, and the animation space. And we do this by doing a drawing dimension analysis. And we infer it from a number of, different, number of different categories. The first way, and clearly the easiest way, is when we label a component. So if you look at this sort of piece here, we can see we've labeled this line to be equal to 10, which means that whatever, you know, 10, time, 10 units of in, in the spatial dimension is going to be equivalent to this particular line in ink space. Well, boom, we have that, and then we have our mapping that we can use. Now, if you don't have that, one of the other things that we can do, maybe you don't want to specify that for some reason, we can look at the initial conditions of a given drawing. In this particular case, at time t equals 0, we see s is equal to 10, h is equal to 0. We can automatically look at that and say, OK, well, given that the line that it's underneath, this is uh, 10 time units, and we can create that mapping. Question? Yes, that's a very good question. And um, sort of the rules underneath it would say, you know, let me find a line or some, some type of object that's... Um, what it would do then, what the system does internally is it, it looks to see if it's got a, a horizontal or a vertical line. And if it doesn't... Right, right. 
Right. Um, then what it's going to do is actually going to, uh, how does this work? You, if, if it's not completely vertical or horizontal, what the system does is then it, it just breaks it up into its like vector components. So what you would get is you wouldn't necessarily say that that would be equal to 10. It might be equal to something less. That's another area that we need to sort of look into to figure out how to further specify those, those types of coordinates. It could be something, something to that effect. Question? Right. That's a very good, yeah. Remember when I said that, um, that we don't have any smart primitives? So it wouldn't really know to be a circle. Um, that, that was always one of the, the, the key focuses of the work, was to see how far you could take it before you started uh, to have those types of primitives. I'm getting to a point where I think you might want to start having some of those. Um, you, curr you can't currently actually just say, OK, well, you know, I draw something, and I say it's a circle, and it turns into a circle. No, it's really not the focus at this point. Right. But um, the question is, do the graphical illustration help you more in the budget than the That's an excellent question. And if the answer is yes, then yes, people will use it. Right. No. That's an excellent question. Uh, let, let, me, let me answer that by saying that one of the th pieces that I have not had a chance to get to, and I'm not sure I will in the context of finishing my PhD was, is coming up with a, a, a debugging system that sits on top of this that sort of helps you figure out when you're making a mistake. Uh, and there's a number of different strategies for doing that. Um, you know, I mean, obviously get, getting, well, one of the things you do is just getting that information from MATLAB and presenting it to the user can help. Um, in my personal experience, I, I've, re I've done sketches where I, you know, I'll be working on it, and and this, you know the an, the animation is wrong, and I'm like, what's going on here? And I look at it, and I see, well, I misspecified the math. So in, in a certain, in many cases, that that can happen. And you can say, well, what if it's just a bug, you know, that you're not sort of getting? That that's a very difficult issue, and it's something that I need to sort of explore later on. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, that I, I'm going to be doing an evaluation of of the MathPad system next week as well. We're starting to. That's one of the things I'm going to talk about, or I'm going to ask, you know, sort of get feedback from the users to see exactly, you know, what they would need in order to, to make it, to get to that next level. Pardon me? Ah, yes, uh, not currently. Something that was sort of in my plan of attack, you know. Um, I've been working on this for about two years now, and I have a long list of things to do. And you know, that one was just something that was, you know, I, when, I, when you think about getting a PhD, you have this tree, right? And you go off, you know, and there's, there's a cool branch here, and you want to go that way, but is it really going to help you get you a PhD? Well, maybe not. We'll just put that off for a side for a bit. And that was one of those ones. I wanted to have a whole set of VCR style <laughs> controls that you could, you know. So the last thing that you can do is, is look at the simulation range to sort of get an idea of, of, of the scale. So let me move on to something that is, I think is one of the more interesting pieces about, about the work, and that is the idea of sketch rectification. So you have to deal with these things, with these imprecise drawings you make and precise mathematical specifications. So what we have to be able to do is rectify these drawings. And that's sort of basically the, the fixing the correspondence between the drawing and the math. And currently, I support three relatively simple approaches for doing that, you know, for angles, position, and scale. So for rectification of angles, 
let's say I draw this, this sketch here, and it's just a little pendulum. And I know, and, and then I, I, I write, I say I want the, 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 the angle to be 0.5 radians. Now, when I drew this sketch, it may very well not be 0.5 radians from this, from this, this vertical line. So what I can do is I can label the drawing. And what the system then does is it looks, in, in this particular case, it says, OK, you wanted this angle to be 0.5 radians. So what it actually does is it moves the pendulum, in this case, so that it fits to, to your mathematical specification. If you didn't do this, but what happened is, is you'd have a pendulum that's sort of swinging off in this funky axis, you know. And the way you know, the angle works by you make the angle gesture, you start from here, and it sort of says, well, as you, the starting point is, is where the angle sort of goes to. And then what it, it actually does is it infers a, a point of rotation based on a little algorithm that looks at the points and sort of extends the lines from question. Right. OK, yes, that, that's a very good question as well. And currently, it won't do that because of the fact that <clears throat> if I have a triangle and I specify the angle, what happens to the length of the, of, of, of the sides of that triangle when I want to still keep a triangle? We're well, moving back into that constraint problem. Right? I think eventually what's going to have to happen is, is there'll be a constraint engine underneath that will help you resolve some of these issues guided by user interface principles. You know, but uh, that's still something that's a little bit. Um, what would it do? Let's see. It probably. Uh, I, I I actually believe that the the way that, the way that I, I wrote it is, uh, if it's one stroke, it, it actually won't do angles. So if you were to draw three, like three, three lines for a triangle, it would just move the triangle like that, and it would be separated. So it would actually break the triangle. I mean, one of the things to keep in mind with this is um, I, I, I've, I've been able to take it to a certain point, and, and I'm still sort of pushing the envelope with it. And, and as I do, you realize that the level of complexity that you're going to get and figuring out and trying to keep the interface as simple as possible just is growing. Right? It's growing a lot. So the, the question then becomes how, how much further can you take it before you have to start adding additional user interface elements and user interface constructs. Um, and that's sort of something that I'm still sort of struggling with or still thinking about. So we've looked at angles. Now let's look at position and scale. This is a little bit easier to deal with. This is the example of the ball mo uh, moving and colliding against two walls. So in this particular example, I have an initial condition that says, you know, at x of 0, it needs to be 5. So we've labeled the drawing saying this is the L equals to 12. And I sort of in assume that when I do that, I have a coordinate system that says that the line here, this is 0, and this is 12. And there's obviously other ways to do it. But I'm sort of just sort of making a convention here which seems to be uh, reasonable. What the system does internally then is it looks to see if I have one of these animatable objects and it has an initial condition associated with it, I then got to go find where it needs to go. So I go ahead and I look for uh, a non-animatable drawing element that has a length associated with it, relatively close to, to that particular drawing. And then it, it moves it accordingly so that it syncs up with the ink, with the ink space for, for the animation purposes. In addition, Scale becomes important because if, if the scaling is incorrect in, in the sort of the correspondence between simulation and, and, and ink space, it's not going to look right. And I struggled with this for a while to come up with a nice way of doing it. And as, once I, as I said, each way, there's sort of drawbacks and hindrances for each one of them. What I came up with is what you do is you specify just a dimension for your object. So x of u equals 1.6. What that says is that this object here has a size associated with it, and it's a uniform size. So it says it's, it's a, has a length of 1.6 and a height of, of 1.6. If I wanted just a length, I would write, or I, just a width, I would write x of, x of w. If it was a height, I'd just write x of h. Okay? 
And the system goes in there and looks at that, figures out what the mapping is, and then scales the object appropriately so that it sort of fits in with the sketch. Okay? There's a number of other ways you can do that. You could do this. I, I could perhaps, you know, make an explicit association and draw a line um, along the object and say that's how much I want it to be. Or uh, there's another other ways. We've also been thinking about how to incorporate units into the into the sketch, right? Meters and inches and rating and things like that, which opens up a, another interesting problem. Question. Um, well, I know how big this ball is in ink space, okay? But I really have no way I, I really don't know, um, oh, I, I, I see what you're saying. So I have this ball in ink space. I know what this length is. I know, yeah, that would be one way you could do it. Um, but maybe I want it to, ch to, to change. You know, the nice thing about it is I, I can change it now, and I can make the ball bigger or smaller. So, yeah. You could certainly do that. Yeah. So that's sort of all, all the things you have to sort of think about when you're taking one of these sketches and you're sort of getting it ready to go to MATLAB. Um, I'm not going to actually talk that much about how we translate everything into MATLAB code. Uh, needs to say. I have never done so much string manipulation in my life. It, it's a, a lot of string manipulation. So what the sketch animation and output system does is it looks for all of these animatable drawing elements. And in this case, an animatable drawing element is one as a function of time. And then it takes all the information from the sketch uh, preparation module and um, cool. actually what it does is it takes, it takes all the data from MATLAB that it sends to it. And then we sort of have this inherent coordinate system, right? Where x is to the right and y is positive y is up. Uh, and it just animates the objects accordingly based on some tick value. And we support things like uh, translational movement uh, in x and y, rotation about a point, or uh, changing an arc value, and stretching, which is really, of course, just a side effect of mailing. Now, I've shown this to a lot of people. I've had a number of people test it. Uh, as I said, I haven't done a formal evaluation yet. That's sort of the last piece of my dissertation work, which is going to start next week. But the overall feedback that I have received from people has been extremely positive. Uh, people have told me that the gestures are relatively easy to learn. The, the quote I hear most of all is they say they wish they had something like this when they were in high school, which I think is pretty cool. Uh, they also sort of ask me all these questions about what, can you, what else can you do with it, you know. Are there more complicated things you can do? Can I do a double pendulum? Can I do, you know, a pendulum with a spring attached to it, attached to a wall, and so on and so forth. And with the open form solution solver that I have in now, you can start to do those types of things, okay, because those are really open form problems. Now one of the other issues, of course, is the math recognition and parsing is still an obstacle. All right. Obviously, the writer has to train on it for, for my system. Uh, I'd love to be able to uh, not have that. Unfortunately, though, when you look at these things, errors increase in proportion to sketch complexity. So even if I got a 99% accurate recognizer, uh, just for symbols, not even talking about parsing, and I write, I have a sketch that read, maybe write 25 symbols, <coughs> to get them all right, it's going down to about 72%. And what that means is, you really, well, two things. Neatness is really important. And the second thing is you really have to have a good correction UI. Okay? Uh, and I can show you uh, some of the correction UI stuff that I've done later on if you want to see it. Now, there's a lot of future work left to do. Uh, as I said, the user evaluation is one of them. I'm very interested in improving the recognition and parsing and a couple of ways of doing that. One is uh, context, trying to take more advantage of context. Uh, looking at not, not only just a simple um, looking at a context um, within an expression, but context across expressions. Sort of see, you know, if, if, if I have h equals 5, and I write another expression down here, and I, I write h in it, and it doesn't recognize an h, maybe we can use that information that we've already recognized in h. We're probably, it's probably going to be an h. Right? So that's something that you need to sort of look at. Um, Adaptive systems are also very, I'm very interested. I'm very interested in 
trying to come up with methods where the users are actually training the system while they're using it. Right? So it sort of reduces the amount of, uh, of, um, of, of training time, but it sort of gets better as they go. And of course, independence would be lovely if Microsoft comes out with a math recognition engine, parsing system, it would be really nice. I want to expand the mathematical sketching language more. Uh, I want to be able to introduce a macro facility where you can actually write small functions and then save them and then use them in other sketches. I'm also interested in more interacti uh, interactivity. Uh, I would love to be able to write a sketch and then instead of just watching it, you actually participate in it. So for example, I have maybe a little uh, a puck or something and I, I, I push the ball as it, as it moves and when it comes back to me, maybe like breakout or something like that. Uh, I'm also interested in moving to 3D, seeing what we can do with three-dimensional sketches. Um, as I said, I use MATLAB as a computational engine, uh, so we have to rely on a commercial product. I would like to be able to sort of use either a public domain computational engine or write my own. It might be kind of cool to do that uh, to sort of alleviate that, that extra uh, burden. Uh, we have a system at Brown that we're working on called ChemPad, which is a chemistry application that allows you to view molecules. And the chemistry professors are using it in, in their classes. And they saw MathPad, and uh, they were very interested in using some of the functionality there. So it would be nice to, um, to combine those two things. I'm very interested in something I call derivation assistance, which is a completely sort of different type of application where the system has understanding of mathematical rules and helps the user derive formulas. Uh, I think that would be a very interesting, very powerful tool. And I'm also interested in you know, various other business applications and, uh, and extending it to other domains, whether it be uh, chemistry or uh, you know, a logic design, other types of geometrical types of things. This is just a little simple example I, that I, I think would be cool to see. I know Microsoft Research China is sort of working on some of this type of stuff. You just draw out a cable and boom, you graph it. So in conclusion, I guess the big takeaway here is that what I've developed is this sort of novel idea, and it's called mathematical sketching. And it is the ability to make drawings and write mathematics, combine them together to make dynamic illustrations. Uh, it's been developed in the context of an application called MathPad Squared, where we've really tried to focus on a fluid gestural user interface. The feedback has been positive, but we still need more work in with the recognition engine, and also work with some of these details that you, that you all have brought up, sort of these more little technical things that are really starting to sort of drive the complexity of the problem. And I, I believe it's really just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the research and, and of what you could do with it. And I'm looking forward to continuing to work on it. And also my colleagues, I know my colleagues at Brown are also very interested in continuing to work on it. So I'd just like to thank my, my committee and some people that have helped me along the way and financial uh, sponsors. So if you have any other questions, I'll be happy to take them. Thank you. Question? Right. Sure. Well, a, a lot of people that um, I show it to that are technical are like, wow, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. You know, some of the more technical people are like, yeah, it's pretty nice. You know, pretty cool, but ask all these difficult questions, which are important questions that need to be uh, addressed. Um, uh, originally, I designed it f for, for students. And I, I always wanted to, I, I sort of envisioned it as, it's sort of a system that they use to help them with when they do their homework. You know, and this type of, of, of sketch is the type of sketch you would see 
um, at least in, to a certain extent, in, in what they might be doing. I mean, obviously saying t equals 0 to, to 20 and adding some of the constructs and whatnot um, wouldn't be there. But sort of the, the, the basis of it what always was, let's see if they can sort of use it to sort of help them with their, their, their work. And of course. I mean, there's tons of different educational software packages out there. I mean, for example, the, I mentioned interactive physics. I don't know if you have if you've seen it. Have you seen it? Yeah, I mean it's it's actually a very nice tool, but what it doesn't do, and a, a lot of these tools they sort of have a uh, a physics engine underneath, All right? So you get to see the behavior of these things. You know, what you don't really get a good is a good understanding of the mathematics behind it. Um, you know, like uh, with the with, with the Physics Illustrator tablet PC tool. You know, you draw a ball and you nail a wall, you know, you draw a little like line or something like that and you nail it to the page and the ball bounces and does its various things. But you don't really understand sort of the kinematics behind it. You can visualize it, but, you know, from sort of an output perspective, but not exactly what's going on internally. And I always wanted to sort of, that's why I, I wanted to expose the math and have the, the users actually write the math uh, in order to do that. I mean, there might be other, I, I thought about what this would be like as a product. And I mean, I, there are a number of changes that I would definitely make. You know, I would not rely solely on just the gestures. Um, I probably have more user interface elements to it, which would then sort of make it uh, a little bit more easy to use. But I, you know, with this work, I wanted to stretch the envelope or expand this, see how far I could go. You know, with just this type of, of approach. Yeah, I mean, I'm not. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, that's definitely a possibility. It would be interesting to see. I haven't had any, any children play with it, and the reason for that is because of the fact that you have to train on it. And I really didn't want to have a, a, a kid sit down and train on the thing for 45 minutes. Yeah, it, I'd probably have to do that, yeah. Um, you know, I. I the, the youngest people that have looked at it are 18, 19 year olds, come freshmen in at Brown. You know, they think it's really cool. So, question? Yes. I've done that, and uh, <laughs> that's one of the first things I did actually. Um, the system right now kind of goes all the way up to. Anything involving, uh, you know, basic kinematics and basic dynamics. When you start getting into things like second semester introductory physics, uh, where you're doing things like optics, um, electromagnetism, things like that, that I, I haven't really looked at yet. But it would be definitely something that I would like to to look at. What what I what I, I also think, you know, I, I was talking about this generality, and uh, you know, I, I believe the generality is important, but I also believe that what, what would probably end up happening if we was to sort of move this to the next level is to have a bunch of specific modules designed specifically for those subsets. So we'd have an optics module, we'd have an electromagnetism module, we have a dynamics module. Simply because it gets so, it, the UI and the inferencing gets so complicated when trying to figure out all this stuff. And that's sort of my, a general feeling in general with, with, with tablet PCs and ink parsing as well. I think if you have specific modules, specific tasks that you're dealing with, you can sort of hone in on those tasks and make the the parsing more robust. So, anyone else? Um, that's certainly a possibility. And a actually, I was I at one point I had the idea of. What you could do if I had an, a physical simulation engine underneath, right? Could could I still? What I wanted to be able to do was specify some of the math, but not all of it, right? And then sort of have a combination of the thing. So I could, for example, write out a differential equation, right, of a motion for something, but I wouldn't have to go all the way through it and solve it, right? I could sort of look at that, and then from that differential equation 
get all the information I need, right, along with the course initial conditions and boundary conditions and things like that. Get all the information I need to then tell the, the simulation engine what it needs to do. And I thought about that as well, but I just haven't had time to do it. That's right. That's, that's, yeah, it is. I mean, but one of the things that I think you need to understand is that that's also part of the research to see how far you can go before you have to cap it. And I'm still exploring that. You know, and uh, I know that at some point, especially if, if you were to turn this into a product, there would have to be a cap, and you, know, you sort of have to figure out exactly what it can do. And that, that may be where that sort of modulistic type of, of, of approach would come in. You know, you can only do certain things with, with this dynamics component. There's only certain things you can do with the optics component, things like that. But yeah, I, I totally agree with you. You know, um, sometimes I, I sit there and I just play, just to see what I can do with it. You know, and, and very often, not very often, but in, 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 on some occasions, you, you sort of come out and say, "Hmm, yeah, maybe I can't do that particular thing." You know, and then you sort of try to figure out how you would extend it. So. It, Okay. Right. Right. Oh, I'll have to take a look at that then. <laughs> I mean, um, if you look at this example here, even with this, right, these conditional clauses, right, uh, I, I first did it, um, I, did a, I did something like this, you know, so that you could do something like this. And I said, well, you know, what if I just wanted to do an if, an if statement? You know, that's where you get something like this. And then I realized, but you know what I also want to be able to do is a little more, a little more power. So let's add some logical operators. So that's where I got and I can do and and or. Then the next step says, but you can only do one, one, one statement with each condition. Right? So how do you do multiple statements? And that's sort of another move forward. Right? In which case, maybe what you do, maybe that's where this macro thing comes in, where you sort of have these little functions you can write, and you place the functions in here. And then boom, that's you have a bunch of things that you can do. So it, I, I'm still, I'm still exploring, and you know, I, I, yeah, I mean, there's going to be a time where you have to sort of sit back and think about. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean like I've there's been ideas about taking just little pieces of this. Like uh some people 
said, you know, just give me the ability to solve the differential equations and, and the, uh, the integrals and things like that, I'll be happy with that. Other people like, give me the, the, the graphing tool. And, you know, work on that, make, you know, add more stuff to the graphing tool. And I, I just love that piece. You know, and then some people say, oh, you know, I, some teachers would say, that I've talked to, say, oh, yeah, you know, I would love to be able to make these little illustrations for my students. So, you know, it's sort of an, an encompassing thing right now. And then you sort of have to take a step back and figure out how you might want to partition it. And, you know, um, just really quick here, talk about correction UI. This is really just the beginnings of this, but if I was to write something like y equals x2, And let's say I didn't want this to be a two, I wanted it to be something else. I can just tap on it. It gives me a list of alternates. Right? And let's say it's H. And then uh, the other thing you can do, which is really nice, is if I want to up, if, I, if this is, if it's, if it's, if it got parsed incorrectly, all I have to do is just circle it, move it. And you'll see that it updates the parse after you've done moving it. So I can do a number of different things. And this, I sort of started, this is the beginning of that derivation assistance stuff I was talking about, where you can just move terms around, um, you know, and, and the system automatically understands what you're trying to do. And you move something from the left to the right of the equal sign, you know, depending on, you know, if there's a plus or a minus sign there, you know, you have to flip it. And so that, that's, this is just the very beginning of, uh, of that. But the, the other area that I wanted to do that I thought about was actually having sort of transparent uh, placeholders for where you could put uh, the symbol. Right? And that is kind of interesting in and of itself, just because you sort of get this explosion of possible parses as you move forward right? between subscript and superscript. So you get subscript, and that subscript could have a superscript, so on and so forth. So that's, I haven't really figured out how to deal with that yet, but just having a small little you know, window here that says, you know, if you want to put a subscript there, put it here. You know, and that's a sort of a way to teach the rules that, that are uh, embedded in the system. So that's kind of just a little bit more about the parsing stuff and the, the correction stuff. Yeah. That's true, but I don't like it very much. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's something, if we could sort of transform that. Would that be uh, Paul Viola? Yeah, yeah I, I spoke with him actually, I was here last year for Tech Fest and, uh, and I talked to him and he said, I, uh, I'm starting to do this. Uh, mm It's just a wacky differential equation I did. It's just it takes a little while to crank it out. Now you'll notice here that this is written in this horribly cryptic looking one dimensional notation. And that's also something that's going to change. I'm going to actually write it you know, in a nice format so that it looks like you wrote it. But um, yeah, the interesting thing about the... Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, people have asked me, say, well, why don't you just LaTeX it or something like that, you know? I could do that. I just... One of those branches, you know? Yeah. <coughs> yeah thank you. Thank you. Okay.